Hi, welcome to Triple E Triple Three Lecture 4D and 4E on combinatorial expressions in Verilog and combinational procedures Hi, in Verilog. Welcome to Triple E Triple Three Lecture. Sorry, that was uh, my my side window telling me that my sound works, which is great. So today we're going to talk about combinatorial expressions and, and combinatorial procedures. Um, so we're going to be working out of more or less um, the directory that we were working out of for in-class exercise four. Um, so I have Xming and Putty working again. Um, so I'm just going to open all the files. Um, well, you know, I, I really only need the, the system Verilog files. So I'm going to open those up. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So for some reason, that does not want to open. There we go. Great. So, so these are the designs that we we had earlier in class, All right? So we we have this this thing where we have a bus A and B. Uh, and we calculate s um, and inside our ad cell we use these as signs on, on boolean statements um, so you you could imagine that we could you know sort of easily just take these uh, these buses and start doing operations on them directly um, so if you were peeking inside of the the implementation of the the checker um, you might have noticed that there was just you know a really simple expression you know s equals a plus b um, so this is the other sort of thing that we can do inside of an assign statement is, is we can say s equals a plus b um, and so this this implies that we would like the hardware to be built as an ad adder um, and that the simulator um, should run any time that and in the simulator anytime a and b changes any bit on that bus um, we should rerun this expression so we should rerun s equals a plus b um, and so we you know we can check to see if this is working the way we we expect so we'll make this you know not that not quite that big um, then we'll open our, our top here and then make sure that our, our checkers aren't running because that'll get annoying in a little bit and then let's make this guy a little bigger great so 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 we can run this guy right so um, you know, just make simv ripple adder, um, and this will run. And then you know, we should get the same result that we got before, that 214 plus 83 is 297. It's great. So this, this makes perfect sense. Um, and then, you know, we can do the other operations that we have from C, you know, the add, subtract, multiply, divide, modulo. So now we do 73 minus 35 is 38. Um, but you'll also notice some very strange things like, 114 minus 207 is now 419 and that you know in no you know this this doesn't quite make sense until you realize that what's happened is if I, i've underflowed right is that and then when i underflow on an eight, on a nine bit thing uh, um that's going to roughly be 419. so cool so that that makes sense um and then we could do multiply so let's let's see what's going on with multiply um, so we could build that out, and then we'll we'll get that out. We'll, you know, for some of these, this will this will make perfect sense, right? Seventy four times two is one hundred and forty eight. Perfect. And then everything else just seems to not make any sense at all. So seventy three times thirty five is not five hundred and seven. That it's not even close. So what what's going on here? Um, so if this were normal um, eight bit math in C, that that makes perfect sense. Um, that we do this and then the 8 bit result doesn't quite match. But on the other hand, we have these, you know, these expressions and for the sum we added a bit to keep track of this, this extra result. So we, we could do the same thing for multiplication, right? Um, so, you know, we, we don't expect it to be, you know, much bigger than 17 bits. So, so there we go. So that's that. You know, we need to make some other changes. You know, we should keep track that that matches in the test bench. And then now, this should just work. Great. So, so now, you know, 76 um, times 60 is 4,560, right? And so 
you know, we, we can kind of check that. Um, in, in Python, you know, this would be how I would check arithmetic really quickly on the command line. Um, you can you know, you go 76 times 60, you know, is it 4,000? Yeah, it is, so great. You know, this, this makes perfect sense. Okay, so now, so, so we could do lots of things, right? We could do divide, um, we can do modulo, um, we can do shifting, um, it, you know, we can start to do comparators. So comparisons are kind of interesting. So, so what's going on with the comparison? So a comparison is something that takes two, two integer things and then produces a Boolean result. So that, that's what we got there. And that's what we got there. And then we should make sure that, you know, we're, we're displaying the result Boolean wise. So good. So, so that, so that, that makes sense. So let's see if that runs the way we expect. Great, so 74 is bigger than 2, 1. 42 is not bigger than 213, 0. Great, so this makes perfect sense. Um, and, and so if we're thinking, like, a lot of these arithmetic things were, were things that we talked about, um, you know, maybe you talked about in 120, and, and certainly the book is going to spend a little bit of time saying, are, are things that I can build out of combinatorial logic. So, you know, there is a way to build these things out of gates. Um, in fact, if you, if you think hard enough, um, some of these things, like comparators, look a lot like adders. Um, right is you can sort of say well if you know if I subtract a from B and then you know there's some bits somewhere I can say that there was you know the, the bits that the the carry out you know there might be greater than you know might be less than and, you know, that's sort of how we build comparators um, you know we have some we can do equivalence expressions this would be kind of silly for for this example because the the randomness um, We'll, we'll never really give us two numbers that are exactly the same. The, the odds are kind of vanishingly small, um, or at least are not going to appear in the 50 cases that I'm going to run. Um, but, you know, that's a valid thing to do. Um, you know, we, we could certainly say, well, what, you know, what are the chances of, of these things being equal? Well, that's, that's certainly much higher, so we could run that, and that, that should work. Um, and and that, that might give us some interesting results where, you know, about one in four times it'll be true. And, you know, that's, that's exactly what we see, right? It is about that. Okay, so no, not quite one in four. It's like one in, one in 16 should be about what we're seeing. All right, so, so these are the things we can do, and that's, that's great. So all these sort of arithmetic-style things we can do. Um, so anything that we could kind of write on one line in C or C++ um, works, works here. Um, and then you're going, but there, there are other things that I built in 120 that, that are not, not this guy that right? So I, I built muxes and you, how do I build muxes? Um, so great. So I have a, um, and I have B. So, you know, we could use our comparator, right? To, to sort of give us the maximum thing, right? So we'll, we'll say, you know, pick A or B based off of their size. So if it's A, if A is bigger than B, I'll return A. Um, otherwise, I'll return B. Great. So, so this is kind of a neat thing, right? This is actually like a, a maxima operator. You know, you know, pick pick whichever one's bigger, and then tell me that that's the result. And then, you know, we're, we should go back and add in all our bits so that we're we're getting the right answer. Um, and then the way this expression works is exactly the way it works in C is this evaluates to a Boolean result. So this should be a single bit thing. If it's one, you put A into S, and if it's zero, you put B into S. So that means that the bit width of A, B, and S should all be the same, um, and that this should evaluate to one bit. Great, so we'll do that. And then it, it's sort of going, well, I don't really know about S, so why, why is it mad about that? Uh, the issue is, is that I didn't save the file. So the, in the old version of the file, the bit widths didn't match. And so it was sort of going, ooh. And, and so what we should get is, you know, the maximum is there. So so that's cool. That's cool. So, and then, we you know, you don't have to do a comparison here. We could just use a bit. So, you know, in, in some ways what we're saying is that if A is even, I mean, sorry, if A is odd, 
return A. Otherwise, return B. This is kind of a weird operator. Um, but, you know, that is totally legitimate. And it doesn't require significantly changing our input, right? So, you know, 56 is even, so we'll return 13. 221 is odd, so we'll return 221. So, yeah, this works the same way, these sort of bits, right? And, you know, if you wanted to build a more a more classical mux, you might just write S. Um, and, you know, we'll change the name of this to Z so that we, we sort of start to have that guy, right? And then, okay, well, so now we need to keep track of what we're doing here. So now we... We're going to add a, a, a select line. So, so we've added a select line, and we, we've sort of renamed our outputs here. So these names should match these names. Um, and then we should make sure that we're printing what we expect. So um, we'll put the select line right there, and then we'll print it right here. Great. And then we should make sure that that is Z, because that is our output. So now we should get S, A, B, and Z. Ooh, and then and then we didn't really define s, and so we get x's, right? So s is x. So if you're using x to make some sort of decision, um, it sort of gets sad. You know, if your mux select is s, it, it is x. It doesn't really propagate through. Um, so fun. So so if it's zero, we picked 75, um, and that's 75. So one is 220. So great. So this this is a mux, um, and this is a mux on a bus, which which is sort of, you know, not something that you know makes not, not something we've definitely shown um, in class. You know, we've shown muxes for single bits, but you can imagine that if we take that mux and just, you know, multiply it in width and distribute the select line everywhere, you know, we could do a mux on a bus. Um, so great. So now we have a mux on a bus. And then, you know, probably the next thing you're going to say is, but, uh, you know, I'm really, I'm really interested in, like, selecting among multiple things. So... You know, we could we could extend this example a little bit, and we'll go. Okay, great. I am interested in you know A, B, C, and D. You know, I want to pick those those two things, and then you know because I'm picking among multiple things now, S needs to be two bits. Great. Um, so you know, let's let's clean up this guy. So the so the way we could do this is. We'll, we'll build a temporary, right? Is we'll sort of go, you know, logic Z1, Z2, and then we'll use these to help us out, right? And, and so we can sort of build a, a tree of muxes like we would, um, like we talked about in class for when we have longer select lines. And then, you know, Z1 and Z2 is determined entirely by the zero bit. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll assign um, Z from Z1 or Z2 based off of S1. So great. So this, this is easy. Um, and then, then we're going to get errors, right? Because it's sort of going, well, you know, I, I don't know about these other things. Um, so what do I do? Um, and that just means that I didn't finish going through the whole example, right? So C and D, and then this is now two bits. Um, and then, you know, there's this, the other interesting factoid here is that um, random only produces a 32-bit number so if I try and assign more than 32 bits at once it, it kind of gets sad so you know this is exactly 32 bits so it works perfectly um, but otherwise not not so much and then percent D percent D and then we'll add C and D great so so this should theoretically work I'd probably have a syntax error in there somewhere. Um, so what's going on?
Ah, so the uh, the compiler is sort of um, sort of dying on me um, without any sort of a, a fun warning. And, and so this is the um, 399.3. Wow, this is, this is sort of the the fun part of this tool is that sometimes you know for no particular reason it decides that it's just not happy with how you're doing things and, it, and it's going to um, going to make make life a little difficult so you know let's let's kind of permute the example until we get something that works because uh, unfortunately there's not much to do um, when it behaves this way other than to sort of throw your hands up in the air and go well you know what am I gonna do <laughs> right so, so now we're, we're sort of going s2 s1 Great, and then you know now we're doing S2, S1. We're doing S2, S1. Great. So, you know, does this help us at all? Yeah. So, you know, who who knows what the issue was there? Um, it just was not very happy with that that specific way that I was writing that code um, so great so, so now we have our our sort of four input mucks oh man and, and we can write our, our little table here uh, of sort of the the examples um, so the, the you know we we have s1 and s2 and then we have Z, right? So we can sort of go, well, what, what is zero, zero? Um, so if S1 is zero, um, we're always gonna pass B and D. And then if S2 is zero, um, we're gonna pass C2, which should be D. So great. Um, and then if, if we make S1, one, and, and S, sorry, we should write this the exact way that there's printing out, right? So, so there's no loss of generality there, but you know, let's do that. And then so now S1 is one, and so S1 is going to pick C for the Z2 case. So we'll we'll write C here. So good. Um, and then you know one zero. So we have S1 is zero. So S1 is going to pick B, and then you know S2 is one. So we're going to pick Z1, which is this guy. So we should get B out. Um, and then you know we write one one, and you know. By exclusion, we get A, and, and so is this what we're seeing? You know, because we've written this A, B, C, D, so all the one ones should be the first one, and then all the zero zeros should be the last one. So great, perfect. So this this all worked, um, but you know, we, I was doing this calculus here, and you know, this wasn't fun, and this seems complicated, right? So what what am I going to do um, when I need to do really large muxes? Um, you know, what if I have a, a, a 20 input mux and I need to pick among 20 things? Um, what am I going to do? You know, do I want to sit here and write out, um, you know, all all of those expressions, you know, roughly 32 of these expressions? Um, I think it's 31 expressions exactly to get there. You know, that that's sort of crazy. I don't want to do that. Um, uh, so, so what's the next thing that I could do? Well, so that that's what brings us to the, these combinatorial procedures, um, and, and that's is sort of the natural way to write muxes. Um, and, and how these work is I, I need to give you a new syntax. Um, so the syntax is sort of always com, begin and end. Um, and so in the same way that our initial begin is a procedure that runs, that just happens to be executed at the beginning of time once, this is a procedure um, that sort of similarly to our assign statements ex executes any time its inputs change. So these assign statements will execute any time S1, A, and B change. This will run any any time any of its inputs change. So so we should we can you know we'll just copy the code that we wrote before in. Um, so that because that should just work. Great. Um, and we, we should get the same results exactly. Yep, so we, we still get the same result. You know, zero, zero gives us the last thing. One, one 
you know, perfect. So when we, we can write the expressions that we would write in assigned statements inside these always com blocks, we just don't use the assigned statement. Um, and so if I'm reading this, you know, what happens? Um, it executes line by line. So first this one, then this one, then this one. Which is, which is different than these guys, right? Because I sort of said, well, these will run independently depending on if its inputs change. Um, so technically, if I, if I rewrote this sort of this way, you know, I would expect that the behavior would not change. But that's not true of this block, right? So if, if I wrote it this way, um, you know, this doesn't look like C code anymore. Um, it does sort of look like the hardware that I wrote up here. Um, so what what will what will happen? Um, so bad things is, is sort of the answer, right? It is no longer does it give you the input you expect. Um, so zero zero gives you one forty three. Well, oh no, that that wasn't even a choice, right? It, it, these were my four choices. So where did this one forty three come from? Well, one forty three was a choice here. And so sort of the uh-oh is, well, it, it appears what's happening is I'm setting Z1 and Z2 um, at this time. And then it, it's not until later that I, that I select Z. I'm picking from the old Z1 and the old Z2. Um, and so that's sort of the, the unfortunate thing with these is that unless you write them in the exact right order, um, you know, the, the behavior really changes. Um, and so one rule to follow is that if you are going to use a result that you've generated um, inside these always blocks, you know, you should be careful to make sure that um, you use it later in the procedure block. Um, and the reason is, is that this procedure block will not get re-executed if it changes its own inputs. Um, but the assign has, does not have an issue here with, with this problem, right? So if I reorder those statements, you know, I still get the same thing, you know, zero, zero gets 133. Um, because these are executed independently, and, and so they, they sort of even if one happens to be run before the others, um, it'll cause the others to re-execute. Um, so that, that kind of brings us to the first rule of thumb is that, you know, in general, to avoid this pain and suffering, if you can do something in an assigned statement, it, it's probably best to do it in an assigned statement. Um, but that's, that's not why we came here. We came here to build muxes, right? And, and that's something we said is kind of hard um, in these guys, right? So. Um, if you're thinking about your, your C, C++ C experience, right, you, you would sort of write a switch statement, right, uh, switch with cases. Um, and so we have something like that. We have a, we call it a unique case. And so, um, you know, it, it looks like this, um, you know, and, and my, my Emacs is very helpfully sort of annotating the end of this statement with what the, the case is. And so what this is going to say is, you know, this is the case, and then tell me, tell me what the matches are. Um, so, you know, we have 2-bit 0, 0, that's the, the first one, and then 2-bit you know, 0, 1, 2-bit 0, 1, 0, um, and 2-bit 1, 1. Great, and then what we said is that if it's 0, 0, z equals d. Um, and and this, should, should, this should be very comforting, right, because we have this table um, and, and now the table just works, right? It is, is that, you know, I wrote this table up above. Um, I can write the table in here. Um, so oftentimes if you're seeing a logic table, um, you should be thinking, oh, I, I, want, a, I want a case statement. And, and so a mux is just a special example of, of how I can take a table and, and get um, sort of this function, right? Um, so, okay, so this is the syntax. And, and how do I read this? So this says whatever this bit string is, find the matching bit string and then execute that line. So S2, S1, so, so let's run this. Um, and those were just some warnings at the top saying that uh, you know we have some unused signals now because we aren't using these temporaries, which was another problem is we had to go through and declare all those temporaries and now, now we don't really have that, right? Um, and we get the same thing that we had before, right? Zero, zero gets you 98, one, one gets you 79. So this is great. Wonderful. Um, okay. So, so now let, let's see how we can make this um, strange, right? It's sort of um, what happens if I forget one of these? So 
So, so what happens if I forget to find one of these cases? You know, what, what happens? Um, you know, if, if you're lucky um, and you use this unique case, it sort of provides a very helpful statement that sort of says, hey, uh, there was there's no match for, there's no condition match in this unique case at this time, right? So one one was the missing case. Um, so I, I don't know what to do. And, and so you get this lovely warning sort of going, great, you know, this is a problem. So what happened with this no match, right? So I still have a design that has one one, and these were my four choices, 79, 160, 185, and 159. And, and none of those are 80, 98. So what did it do? Um, it remembered <laughs> what the last choice was. And it keeps that one. Um, and, and sort of missing cases imply latches. So that, that's not good. So, so you generally don't want to do that. So you want to make sure that all your cases are defined. And unique case sort of helps you out by going, great, you know, don't, don't do that. So, so how else could I go off the rails here, right? Um, so I, I could change this to Z1, right? So Z1 was one of my temporaries. And, and you know, will the, will the code have a problem with this? And, and you'll go, oh, no. You know, there's no, there's no warning now. Um, you know, now the one ones are happy. You know, the unique case has a, found a case to execute, so it ran. Um, and so the, the promise you make with a unique case is that, you know, one and only one case will match um, and, and then it's happy so that that was the promise you provided but beyond that you know it, it's up to you and so the way I've written this you know it's really obvious that we've made a mistake right is hey all of these should be Z I'm building a mux you know why is this one going to Z1 um, and you know we get the same behavior that we saw before that one one is 129 which is the last one so we've implied a latch um, so what implied latches are Um, is, is sort of a, a failure to define outputs on all conditions. Um, and that's, that's sort of a promise that we're making when we write always com, right? Is, is sort of we're saying this is combinatorial. Um, and so if we imply a latch, you know, that's not combinatorial. And, and so if we're saying it's combinatorial, what we're saying is that the, the outputs are defined for all possible um, executions of this procedure. Um, and, and so that, you know, we broke that promise here and, and that's why we're getting the latch. And, and so we, you know, we fix it and things are back to normal. Great. So, so now, now the next question, um, sorry for the, the, the bells. Um, so the lawyerly folks, um, paying attention in class will go, Oh, um, he said that if this bit string matches this bit string, that's different than a case statement in um, C. In C, it, these are integers. So I put an integer here and it's 0, 1, 2, 3, and that's how that works. And that's sort of what we did here. Um, but I don't have to do that. Right, so I could put 1 bit 1 here. And then just put an expression here. So equals equals is a, you know, that's a combinatorial expression, so that's fine. Um, and, and, and roughly what we're saying is, you know, we have the bit string bit one. And then we're going to evaluate all of these strings. I mean, all of these expressions and then see what they evaluate to. So when it's a constant and we evaluate a constant, that's that's easy, right? The constant is what it is, um, so that, that matches. But now we're saying, well, evaluate this expression and is it one bit one? Um, so this is sort of a fancy way of saying, you know, which one of these is true? That's the one I want. You know, and, and you know, let's save the file and check if it works. You know, great, we get the, the exact same answer that we got before. Um, you know, that, that the 1, 1 still gives us the first thing, 0, 0 gives us the last thing, you know, 0, 1 is going to give us this 129, it matches this 129, so great. That, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, these are, these are expressions, and, and you know, now you can see why I would start to worry if not all the cases are represented, 
Um, because I, I could put really arbitrary things here, right? You know, I, I, I could start to put arbitrary expressions that get evaluated. Um, and so then we really need to worry about one, one and only one case will match. Great. So what if, what if you're, you're sort of going, but I don't want one and only one case. I want the first case, right? So normally I write if else code and I'll, I'll write this chain of if else's. I want the first one to hit. So, so then I write the priority case, which sort of says, you know, I promise one will match. I promise at least one will match. But execute the first one. Um, so you know, you know, we could really confuse the code by sort of like, okay, now we have you know two identical cases here, and you know we'll, you know we'll write, you know, tick zero and you know tick one. You know, this is clearly not what we would want to happen in this case. Um, so are are we going to be safe? Um, and the answer is yes. You know, we're still going to get the same things because the first case matched exactly. Um, so if we wanted to see, you know, when things go awry, you know, we put it slightly ahead and then we start to go, okay, you know, what's going to happen now? Um, and now every now and then we get zeros, right? Is, is that any time that we have this one zero case, um, we get zeros and that that's not good. Um, but that, that's sort of how the, the code we wrote works, um, which can be very helpful if sometimes you're thinking that, you know, I, I know that some of these are going to be true and that you know I have a priority that if I do this this is the most important thing so so then you write that case statement um, so one thing I will say is that a priority case statement in terms of hardware is, is sort of worse um, and the way to think about this is this is that you know how to build a mux and, and that's a unique case statement so if I'm going to build a priority case statement clearly I'm going to need a mux um, but they haven't promised me that my my inputs are unique anymore um, which means that in order to generate the, the select lines for my mocks, um, I need to do some extra work. Um, so I need to do some extra work to make sure that they they become unique. So I'm going to build something that is sort of the complexity of an adder, um, and, and we'll explore this in the next homework, um, called a, a, a priority encoder. Um, and that priority encoder is added to a unique case statement or a normal mux to build the priority case or the priority mux. Um, so that, that's sort of the only thing to keep track of. It, it's not too much to worry about. It, it's sort of in the same vein as like, hey, just keep in mind that a multiplier is much bigger in terms of hardware than, than an adder. Cool. So so now, you know, we, we've sort of got this thing. We, we have this guy, and this is great. Um, so you're going, well, I, I, don't, I don't like these assigned statements. You know, this is sort of a nasty way to write code. Um, I want to go back to writing C code, and, and you've just provided me this wonderful place to go write C code. So I'm going to do that now. Is I'm, I'm going to stop stop worrying about these assigns. I'm going to completely ignore you know all all your statements about be very careful, um, and I'm just going to go write some some C code. So you know what what would be you know some function that you wouldn't necessarily have some hardware. Um, so we could sort of go well Z1. Um, is equal to zero. So this is this is weird. You know, this is supposed to be hardware, but here I am, sort of, you know, declaring some initial things, and then, um, you know, let's let's give myself an integer. You know, nobody said I can't have integers, so you know that's a legal type in this language. Um, and then I'll I'll have a for loop. You know, this this is what I'm doing down here. You know, I could do that up here, right? Even though this is hardware. Um, nobody's going to do that. And then you know we'll use some of my inputs. So we'll use b, you know, b two to zero. So we'll, we'll use the lowest bits of b. We'll do i plus plus. Begin end, and then we'll sort of go well. Um, you know, let's give ourselves an extra, an extra swap variable. You know this might might come in handy. So I'll go, okay, ZS is, is equal to Z2 plus Z1. So this is sort of the Fibonacci 
generator, and then you know we'll say that Z1 is the old one, so Z, that gets Z2, and then Z2 gets ZS. And then we can run that in a loop, so that's what we're doing, and we'll run that B times. So now, you know, now we've built something that is sort of, um, in quotation marks, it is combinatorial hardware that builds these Fibonacci numbers, and then, um, you know, we should we should assign the output, right? So we'll we'll sort of say, well, Z is the output of my block, and, and I'll assign that to ZS. So now, so now I'll get, you know, some, B is the Fibonacci index, and then this will be the Fibonacci number. Great, so I can run that hardware. Um, so we'll we'll just put that directly into the into the framework. So we'll sort of go. Okay, well, what what exactly is happening here? So this is two zero, and then, then we have z. And let's make sure that everything is saved. And then and then now it's kind of sad because I forgot the comma here. Um, and then this is sort of weird, you know, is, is this the, the Fibonacci number that we expect, you know, so we could, we could sort of go, Hey Google, you know, you know, what's Fibonacci sequence, right? You know, we don't quite trust that, you know, I actually know the Fibonacci sequence, right? So, so fourth one is five, right? So, okay. So that, that's good. And then, so that if we look through our list, we should see the fifth one is eight. Okay, so this is making sense. This is making sense. So, so we're we're good. You know, we built something that theoretically works. You know, we can, you know, let's ramp it up here. Let's do four bits instead of three, and let's go crazy. Um, start to get some, you know, larger and larger numbers. Um, and let's actually remember to save the, the thing that we're doing so that we actually see the update. Um, great. So now we're now we're getting now we're getting some more. So now we have some real, real, real stuff here. So. You know, is this hardware? You know, can I build this hardware? Um, so the, the one answer is yes. I, I could totally build hardware that does this. Because um, if I think about this from some perspective, what I'm saying is I have a complex way of calculating a number based off of the input B. Um, the, the, not just B, but the four lowest bits of B. Um, so I could build a huge lookup table are, are not even that huge. It's just a 16 entry lookup table for B and just return what the Fibonacci number is. Um, so that, that's not too crazy. Um, so theoretically I could build that. And then, um, you know, as, as I start to make this bigger and bigger, um, that becomes less and less feasible, right? I, I start, I'm sort of talking about something, the complexity of a, a, a random um, lookup memory, right? It is sort of, actually save the things that we're doing so that we get the, the whole numbers there. Um, and so we're getting some overflows now because now we have really, really big numbers. Um, so, you know, we, let's tone it down to, to C. So, right, like 32 should be reasonable here. Um, and yeah, so so what are, what are we going to do? You know, is this real hardware? In some ways, yes. You know, this is something that we could build. Um, does this reflect the hardware that I actually want? No, not at all. Like this does not look like the hardware that I would build. This is not code that represents that hardware. Um, we're sort of giving the code, um, giving the tools a C procedure and then hoping, you know, sort of praying that it'll figure out what we want. Um, so that, that's sort of the first thing that I would worry about. And then, you know, for some of these where the execution is indeterminate, you know, it, it has trouble figuring out what to do. Um, so if this gets really big and we're talking about large numbers, it starts to go, well, I, I don't have the space to allocate these things. Um, and so this can be really dangerous. Um, so anytime you think you see for loop, you know, think that, oh no, I, I could be building something much, much larger than I really expect. Um, which, which is something that I would worry about. Um, and the other thing is, is that this, this doesn't get a block. This isn't going to match any block diagram for the hardware that I expect. Um, which is sort of unfortunate. So this is totally fine verification code. It's just not very good um, C code. So so yeah, so we've opened a crazy door here, right? So, so procedures can be non-hardware. Um, so I, and I, I would sort of consider this Fibonacci sequence to be non-hardware. Um, it you know it does something, but you know I don't actually mean provide me this adder. I don't actually mean like build this shift register thing, right? Like this is not what we would get. What we would get is a lookup table. Um, that, that is ultimately what it would build um, if we're lucky. 
um, you know, we could run synthesis on this in C, and, and more likely than not, it would it would sort of go, no, you know, I I I don't want that. Um, that's not what I care about. Um, you know, let's you know, we could sort of run that on the side and, and sort of see where we're going with this. So let's see, tail make file. So we could just look at the end of the make file. Um, so apparently, I need more than those lines. So what is what is our make file rule? Well, it's sin under log. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll change my simv to syn. So now, so this is going to run the synthesis tool. Um, and so this is running the, the tool, and you know, it might not be the the best. It's going to throw a bunch of errors because something doesn't quite match up. You know, it's expecting a sequential design, but this is combinatorial. Um, but you know, we'll eventually get where we're going here. Um, and this is going to take a long time for something that's relatively simple. Um, so, so what are the other things that can happen here with this crazy door? So, so procedures can be non-hardware, um, right? So we, we built something that, you know, can be turned into hardware, but it's not hardware. Um, it can be bad hardware. Um, so, you know, we could start to build really large things really quickly. Um, so, you know, while this is running, we'll start to make some edits here. We'll start to go, well, what if I'm interested in the maximum, right? So I showed you that, that maximum operation before. Um, you know, I could start to build more complicated things, right? So I could start to go, well, let's let's build the maximum of this. Um, you know, and, and so what did this build? You know, did this, this is actually finish and, and come up with something that, that worked? Um, and, and sort of, it did, um, but it came up with something very large. Um, you know, it came up with something that is sort of 500 microns and takes forever to run is sort of, I think, what it's saying here. Um, you know, it sort of has some area and it's long delay. Um, it's not quite clear what it built. Um, you know, we can look through the, the physical design and start to go, what did it do? So we have these reports. Um, you know, we could check the area. Well, let's check the timing. So what did it actually build? Um, you know, so it built something. It, it implied a bunch of latches. Um, you know, it, it's not clear that it actually built anything that, that reflects what we wanted. You know, it could actually have built something else. Um, you know, maybe in a future class, we could pull this example up and start to look at the actual schematic that it generates and, you know, simulate the resulting gate in that list and go, ooh, this, you know, this did not build what I expected. Um, so, so what about designs that, that, that are hardware, but just bad hardware? Um, so let, let's do maximum. All right, so we'll, we'll keep our swap variable. Um, we'll keep our, our, our index here. Um, you know, we'll, have, we'll initialize the swap to A0. Um, and then, you know, this is something we've done before. You know, we sort of write I1. You know, we're sort of, we can statically say three. So this is a good sign, right? Is that now our for loop has deterministic bounds. So it's sort of saying to the hardware, I know exactly what I want. Um, you know, just build it for me. Um, and then we could say, well, you know, if ZS is, is smaller than AI, if ZS is, 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 oops, so if ZS is smaller than AI, then, you know, ZS equals AI. Okay, so that, that's cool. And then we can, you know, put Z in ZS. Um, and this is, this, you know, this isn't the best thing in the world to do. You know, it, it's implying some strange things are happening. Um, but let you know, let's let's walk through this. Um, and so this this three colon zero is sort of saying I want an array of four eight bit things. Um, and, and we can, which is sort of helpful when you don't want to do this sort of syntax. So let's clean up our test bench. So now we're just initializing A's, which is fun. Um, and now we have a, a lot more, a lot more inputs again. You know, and, and for very large things, you know, in the verification code, I might actually write, you know, for loops that look like this. Um, but now, now, now I have this guy, and you know, hopefully, I didn't make too many mistakes. Uh, 
Um, and so hopefully what we get is, is something that finds the largest of the four inputs. So, you know, we have 101, so that's the biggest thing, 229, that's the biggest thing. So, so what's going to actually happen when it builds this hardware? So if I'm thinking about the block diagram it creates, um, it, it's going to put four, three of those comparators that I talked about before in series, right? So um, it's sort of the it's serial um, maxima operation. All right, um, and, and if each maxima takes 200 picoseconds, then, then total is, is 600 picoseconds. Uh, but this is hardware and everything happens at once. Why, why would I wait to find out what the result is? So we, we had that maxima thing before. Let, let's, you know, let's use that locally and see, see where we can go with that. You know, so let's, let's break out these assigned statements, right? Assign Z1 equal to, you know, is, is A0 bigger than A1? Then do A0 and then otherwise do a1 all right so this is this is easy right assign and then we'll do two and three and then two and three so this, this is good um and then you know we can assign z um is, is z2 bigger than z1 well if it is then output z2 otherwise put z1 um, and, and so in this case, what we're doing is we're going to compare A0 and A1 in parallel with A2 and A3. Um, so, you know, we, we do this tree, um, tree comparison. Um, and so instead, the delay is 400 picoseconds because these happen in parallel. Um, and so the worst case delay is, is, you know, through these inputs, through Z1, um, and then through this comparison into Z, um, and then the exact same delay through these inputs um, into Z2 and, and so on and so on. Um, you know, it's actually through the comparator because the comparator switches the mux, but you know, this comparison, then this comparison, and, and that's what takes so long. So this is the 400 picoseconds. So that's, you know, we shaved some 200 picoseconds off and, you know, hopefully this worked. Um, you know, we get the exact same result. Um, and then, you know, theoretically, if we went and built the hardware, you know, we get a better, better answer. Um, so, but this, this is kind of an annoying way to write this, but it, it's the actual hardware that I'm interested in, right? Is if I draw the block diagram, I can label all the signals. In this case, we had something weird happening here, right? We had the ZS signal and it keeps getting reassigned. And that's not good because there's no way to do that in hardware, right? Is I have wires. Uh, so... So in, in some ways, this is this is very worrisome because um, well, what's going to happen? So if if the tools are really smart, what they're going to do is they're going to see, oh, clearly you're doing this incremental update, and you you mean this to be some temporary signal. So I'll I'll create a new temporary signal for you every time you reassign ZS, and, and I'll try and help figure out what the worst case um, worst case reassignment is, and I'll allocate that many temporaries. Um, but sometimes it won't, and it'll just yell at you. Um, and go, sorry, this, this is not something I know how to build, you know, come again later. Um, and, and this is much clearer. This sort of matches what you're doing. Um, and you might complain, you know, for large things, right? What if we had to compare 32 inputs? 32 inputs is a lot. And, you know, I'd have to write 31 statements here, but, you know, largely I'm just going to change this three to a 31 and I'm great. Um, so what, what do I do? Um, and the answer is, well, you're building hardware, right? We're not writing software. We want good hardware. So we're going to go write that code to get good, <laughs> good hardware. Um, and the good news is that later in the class, you know, we'll, we'll talk about how exactly you would write that very compactly, right? Um, you'd sort of go, well, I'm building trees. So there must be some way to do a for loop to build a tree. And, and we'll talk about that. But, you know, um, for most of the problems that you'll be asked to do in class, you might have to compare like eight or 16 things, which isn't too awful. Um, and you do have a copy paste routine and you should be able to draw figures so that that's not too bad. Um, and, and generally when you work that way, things will go a lot, a lot better. Um, cool. So that, that's that, uh, you know, you just going to accidentally be bad hardware. The, the one that generally causes the most trouble is if you try and build an accumulation, right? Is you sort of go, well, ZS, 
Um, you know, let's let's walk through that, right? So we have four things, and we go, okay, I, I want to add those together. So I'll say ZS is zero. Uh, and then, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll add AI to it. So, you know, this, this should go, you know, hopefully this goes okay, but, you know, bad things could happen, right? And, you know, there's not quite what you expect, right? You're, you know, for some reason I'm always getting, excuse me, 234, and sometimes I'm, I'm not. And so, you know, this, it, you know, it looks like this should work. And then it, it doesn't. Um, it's partly because I have the if here. Um, you know, you got to be careful when you're building these examples. So, so now when we accumulate this, right, it is we 101 plus 9 is 110. So we get a, you know, 115. So we're still not not quite lining up here. So what's what's going on? seems to be missing this last one, right? And, and so what's the issue? Well, um, clearly the answer is, is that this should be four. Yeah, so now now we're getting the, the sum that 125 is expected. Um, and I bet that some of my earlier comparison cases, you know, did quite sometimes mix the maxim, maximum when it was the fourth one. All right, so, you know, that's summation. Um, and, and what does this imply? Uh, this applies a serial summation of things, like a serial addition of things. Um, and if you have a really good synthesis tool, it'll actually figure that out. Um, but it turns out that oftentimes I can build a really efficient adder if I know that I'm summing things up. Um, and, and so, you know, I might just be better off writing th this long version directly. Um, you know that this is, is almost always going to be better than than the other one, um, because the tools often have trouble sort of introspecting these loops and then figuring out exactly what you mean. But for this, it, it knows exactly what you want. Is this is build a summation unit, um, and, and the nice thing about a summation unit is, is that it's it's much more efficient than um, you know adding something three times, right? So it, it's not going to build three adders. It's going to build one unit that, that sums, sums things up. Um, but in this case, it might actually build three adders, which, which is sort of a strange thing that happens. So um, in general, you know, the rule of thumb that I would follow is that, it, you know, if you can write, write it purely on one line like this, I would try and do that. Um, so, and so that kind of gets us to the ground rules here. You know, only... You know, in general, only use an always com for mux. Um, you know, if you mean a mux, write an always com with a unique case in it, and then you know only one unique case for always, an always com block. Don't don't really put anything else inside. Um, you, everything else should be in a signed statement. Um, and then when you're using that mux, be very careful to avoid the implied latch by making sure that all of your outputs are defined for all possible cases through, and then make sure you're keeping your promises with the mux. Um, which is, you know, if you build a unique case that, you know, all of the conditions, um, you know, that one and only one of the conditions match, and that for the priority case, at least one condition matches. Cool. Um, and then what else? So, so one thing that we forgot is that sometimes I, I will build a mux. So let's uh, let's let's build ourselves a little a little janky mux where you know we'll we'll switch on a one and zero, um, and then we'll sort of go okay well two bit zero one is z you know z equals a zero, um, then two bit one zero you know z equals a one, and then you know those are really the only two cases I care about. You know, if it's that one, do that one. If it's the other one, do the other one. And then in all other cases, I really, you know, I, I, I need to define it just in case, right? Um, but it turns out that I, I'm probably not too worried about what's going to happen. You know, you, you want to provide this default case. 
Um, and in this case, we'd sort of say, well, I, I, I need a, I need an output that is 8 bits, so I'll, I'll provide that, and so I'll say 8d0. So this is another way to write a constant, and sort of saying, hey, you know, I have 8, um, the decimal is 0, you know, to be sort of thorough, I'll just have three zeros to make sure that it's not sort of inferring things that I'm being explicit. Um, and, and so now, you know, this this will do that, and then um, and then it's complaining at me because I forgot my end case here. Ah, so the issue is is that I need to nest these because um, I meant the the two leading bits of the first day. So yeah, so every every now and then we'll we'll get some zeros where um, you know it just so happened that it was zero zero or or one or one one, and you know we see a few cases here where that makes sense. So that that's the default case, and and so this might be a good way to guarantee that you know. One and only one case is definitely true, and that, especially in the priority case where you're worried about falling through to the bottom, um, that that you have a default guaranteed there. Um, so yeah, so those are the, the kind of the ground rules for always com is that you know only use them for muxes and then make sure all your cases are there, um, and that even though you can write C like code, just don't don't do that. You're, you're going to cause yourself pain and suffering. Um, think about the block diagram, draw the block diagram, write the code for the block diagram. Um, it is helpful for debugging every now and then. So, you know, you might go, you know, it, it, I would really like to see um, any time an input changes. You know, and so I'll go, okay, well, well, we'll write this. And then what it says is that any time an input to the block changes, um, you know, output what that answer is. And so we can do that, you know, output Z. You know, so anytime there's a new Z, just display it. So, so that's what it did. You know, we got a new Z here. That's great. Um, and and the only the only caveat here is, is be careful um, about what you're writing. Um, for example, you know, do how do I expect this to work? You know, which should I see first? Um, you know, I, I just wrote these two always com statements, and, and we sort of said that these are blocks that are sort of like big assigned statements, so they could get run in any order. Um, but but a lot of us will read this and go, oh, clearly foo will always execute before bar um, because it's higher up in the file. And then, you know, great, is that what we see? Oh, that's wonderful. You know, it's exactly the way I expect with, you know, no changes. Um, but what if I change where it is in the file? It, so now, now I'm expecting, given this rule, that I should see bar and then foo. But that's that's not what I see at all. I see foo and then bar. So this is upsetting because because this means that potentially, um, you know, the order of this execution could really change um, depending on what happens. And, and sort of going back to the definition, is it's a procedure that gets run when its inputs change. And that a0 is going to change before z because a0 is going to change, which will run either this procedure or this procedure. And then that'll cause z to change, which will cause this procedure to run. So just because they're ordered in a certain way doesn't guarantee um, when they will run. And then the, the other thing is that there's no guarantee that just because two things have the same inputs that the one higher in the file runs first. Um, you know, we, we could sort of hope that that's true. Um, and and that, that might be the case in a good number number of times. Um, and But, you know, very quickly you go, oh, no. Like, it, it's actually the opposite, is that the one at the bottom um, executes first. Um, why, why is that? And the answer is that it made a decision about who runs first, um, and it has nothing to do with the order that they're written in the files. So to be very careful about that. Um, and, and so these are helpful, um, but, but keep track. And, and, you know, just make sure that you understand the order of these things is not intuitive at all, that they are completely independent, that they happen at once, 
at all times. And, and so even though the print is serial, um, really they, they kind of are happening at the same time. And how do I know that they're happening at the same time? Well, I, I can actually just ask, right? Is I could go, well, tell me what time it is um, when you're running. So that, that's not too much to ask. You know, tell me the time. So, so now we're gonna we're gonna have a bunch of times zero t. You know, and, and for completion's sake, you know, we'll we'll update this one. We'll say you know percent zero t. Um, and the percent t just means you know format as a time. And then the zero means don't don't show me the leading zeros. I don't I don't want the leading zeros or don't provide the spaces for the leading zeros. Exactly the same way that a printf works. And then the taller time is a, is a function that'll tell me the current time in the simulator. It'll actually tell me the tick count. And then, you know, let's make simv, run the ripple adder. Um, great, so, so what happened here? Um, well, it, it's convinced that, that these all ran in the same tick. Um, but it had to pick an order for them to run in. So in, in simulation world, they happened at the exact same, like, quote, time. Um, but because it's being simulated, they, it had to pick an order to run them in. I um, mean, you can see this other print ran at a different time. So what, what's happening? Um, so if I look at the bottom here, um, you know, I, I'm assigning these to random. And so in that simulation tick, it, it's going to go update all these things and run them. And then it's going to wait 10 ticks and then display the result. And then it's going to wait one tick and then run again. So, so that's what's happening here is that, you know, my inputs changed. It's 528. I waited 10 ticks. Now I'm going to print them. I'm going to wait one tick and then change them again. Um, and that's why we, we sort of get these odd numbers. Um, now, if you're trying to sort of bind this to simulation time, it's going to tell you that this is roughly picoseconds, that these are 550 picoseconds. But clearly, this is 100% arbitrary, as I just said, 10. And 10 whatever um, and that's because somewhere in in the tools I've sort of said oh you know you know picoseconds are, are the time scale is in picoseconds and, and so don't you know don't think that there's something else think that they're picoseconds but the reality is the simulator is going to just say that a tick is a tick cool so so that's about it for combinatorial expressions and, and combinatorial procedures in Verilog um, what we're going to do on Monday um, is we're going to start building an ALU. Now, the ALU is, is what you were doing in the uh, lab one. So this is the kind of code that they gave you was a calculator ALU. Um, and you can imagine that ALU is pretty important in hardware, right? It's the, the unit that tells us what function to run. Um, and, and the way to think of it is, is I need a box that if I give it an opcode or an instruction that tells me add, that it takes its two inputs and adds those and gives that as an output. But if I have another opcode input that says subtract, it should subtract. Um, and, and so this will start to combine some of the, the things that we've been doing where we have expressions and we have these muxes. Um, so, you know, something to think about over the weekend is how might that work? Um, and, and, you know, this, this has sort of been an interesting way to show you guys how to code. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure this wasn't the most convenient as you weren't able to sort of ask me questions. So please feel free to go on Piazza and, and start to fill in questions about, you know, did this make sense? Did this not make sense? Um, you know, or, oh, I want a different example. You know, can you give me another example? Um, the good news is, is that you guys have all the tools to go ask these questions, right? Is, is I took the example that I gave you guys for in-class exercise four, and I just made small changes to it, and then we got to this radically different position. Um, so certainly you are capable of sort of like pausing this video, typing in the things you see on the screen, and then going, ooh, I wonder what happens if I do this instead. Um, and, and, you know, that that's actually a lot of how I learned how these things work, is by going, I wonder what happens if I try and trick it into doing something that I want or don't want to happen. You know, am, is it protecting me or are there these, these chasms that uh, are poorly marked that I can easily fall into? Um, but otherwise, you know, that, that's about it. So thank you um, for, for bearing with me and, you know, hopefully this was, this was pretty helpful. Have a good weekend.